Right, okay. Okay, good morning again. Uh, we have Ingo Waldman from University College London today. And uh, to introduce Ingo, Ingo, so he uh, did his PhD at, at UCL at University College London. He finished in 2012 and he has stayed there since. <laughs> Very nice place. <laughs> I really like UCL. Uh, in 2019, he won an ERC grant. Uh, for developing machine learning solutions for extrasolar planets. And he's currently the PI of the UCL Exo Artificial Intelligence Group, uh, there at UCL. He's uh, an associate professor and deputy director of the UCL Center for Space and Exochemistry Data. And uh, he's also the machine learning lead of the ESA uh, Ariel Mission Scientific Consortium. And in 2019, he won the Fowler Award uh, by the Royal Astronomical Society for his work on machine learning uh, in exoplanets. And he's also the director and co-founder of Space Flux uh, Limited, I think it's the company. And uh, they, they are developing machine learning solutions for space situational awareness. Uh, and uh, Bingo, whenever you're ready. Thank you very much. Thanks for having Thank you very much me. for joining us today. Oh yeah, well, it's an absolute pleasure, and um, it's it's sad that I can't come to Madrid. I I love Madrid, um, <laughs> so I will go bother you at some stage when we're yeah, allowed definitely again. Definitely do. Yeah, whenever <laughs> possible, we will definitely have you here. <laughs> yeah, so. Um, Yes, um, please interrupt me if you have any questions during the talk or afterwards. It's, I don't, I don't mind at all. Um, so yeah, to, to introduce, yeah, um, to introduce the group a little bit. So we are the uh, it's an ESC funded group um, set up to to build machine learning solutions in exoplanets. Um, because you know, machine learning it's it's all over the news. It's everywhere, and it's doing great stuff. But you know, planetary science has, has been lagging behind a little bit um, here and there. So we are, you know, a small keg in the in the bigger bigger machinery trying to address that. Um, from the um, yeah, um, from the ESA side, we actually have a co-founded student, David Smith. Now um, that's interesting. So he'll be in Madrid um, half of his time. So you you might be able to run into him and bother him. Uh, please do. It's very nice. And uh, today I will just present two um, works by, by by two of my PhD students. So this is um, Gordon Gordon Yip and and Mari Morgan. Um, yeah. So a very, very quick introduction to um, exoplanet atmospheres. I mean, you, you, you all know um, what they are and, and that we're looking for them and, and so on and so forth. So I don't really need to go into much detail. So I've just drawn a, a, an illustration of an exoplanet on my iPad with my own very own fingers. Um, but, you know, planet atmospheres give you quite a lot of insight into exoplanets. So we know over 4,400 exoplanets now. Um, but beyond its mass and radius, you know, it'll give us the density and that gives us some insight into what these planets are, but that's not necessarily enough to really understand what their formation history is. Um, so atmospheres will be able to, you know, give us some insight there. Uh, they'll be able to tell us whether there have been impacts or, you know, um, radiative forcing by the star um, clouds. So we can see um, some indication of clouds in hot Jupiters and smaller planets already with the Hubble Space Telescope. So um, that's quite interesting. And, you know, with um, the James Webb Space Telescope aerial and the ELT, so on and so forth, we will actually be able to tell exactly what the cloud composition is and, you know, cloud coverage of these exoplanets. So that's quite cool. Um, as I said, stellar radiation, um, the disequilibrium chemistry, um, um, how, how that is affected by the star, because since most of these planets are very close in. As you know, these hot Jupiters only have an orbital period of a few days. Um, and, you know, it affects every planet. And then, you know, um, that can lead to escape um, of the atmosphere and so on and so forth. We can look for volcanoes or secondary atmospheres. So rather than hydrogen helium dominated, we can look for more evolved atmospheres especially when we go to the super Earth regime, that's, that's an important 
um, aspect. Yeah, and, and you know what the media likes is uh, are the bias signatures or not. Um, so we, we're still quite far away from that, to be honest. Right. To to be able to do all this, you know, you need to have an integrated approach to to studying exoplanets. So there's there, there are multiple subfields that have to interlink. So it's a very interdisciplinary field. So you go from you know having to detect the planet in the first place to you know um, analyzing the data and the data is extremely low signal no to noise usually it's very much at the instrument um, um, limit most of the times once you have the data it's so for example spectrum of an exoplanet atmosphere you still need to model that um, spectrum and that's very difficult because the data is one dimensional quite often it's just a transit spectrum or, or you know you have face curves now as well but you know, modeling a 3D atmosphere um, is very, very um, complex and cumbersome. And, you know, some, some people here in the audience um, are uh, um, very, very good experts on this. So, you know, I don't need to tell you about this. And, you know, once we've done all that, you know, it's lessons learned and we need to um, build new instruments and figure out new, new anal analysis techniques for, for the upcoming um, data that's coming with James Webb and, you know, Aerial. Right, so here I'll just um, talk about two aspects very briefly. So that's um, data analysis, what we've done recently, and then the atmospheric modeling as well. And I'll be focusing more on, on what we've done with the deep learning side here. So for the transiting exoplanet, so this is obviously the transit of Venus um, in front of our own star, um, but an exoplanet is exactly the same thing, just further away. Um, when the planet transits in our line of sight, uh, we see this drop in the stellar light, which is you know called the light curve. So I'm sure you've all seen this before. And you know, should the planet have an atmosphere, then some of the stellar light will shine through that planet's um, terminator. And depending on you know the composition of that um, atmosphere, um, we'll we'll get a spectrum out. Now that is of the order of ten to the minus five. Um, photons, 10 to the minus six sometimes, if we want to be really going for this Earth super Earth regime. So these, these are tiny, tiny effects. And these are effects an order of magnitude lower sometimes than the instrument noise that we are observing with the current instrumentation. So it's, uh, it's, it's a data mining issue more than anything else. Um, yeah, so, um, so we've looked into uh, how, how to address um, this with um, deep learning. So we've looked at the Spitzer Space Telescopes. The reason why we've looked at Spitzer, Spitzer is dead, as you know, unfortunately. Um, but Spitzer is very characteristic in, in its infrared detectors. It have very similar detectors to what's being fly, will fly on James Webb. In fact, it's you know, basically just two generations older because there, there was a bit of a hiccup in the detector development. Um, in between those two missions. So, so they're very, very similar. Um, so looking at old Spitzer data actually will allow us to really understand how we should go ahead with James Webb modeling as well. Now, uh, I, I, always, I always show this to just, you know, shock people and, and, and show how bad things really are. Um, I hope you can see my cursor. Um, but this is, these are different channels of, um, of Spitzer and uh, you have uh, so photometry channels basically. And you, in the first two you have um, um, the eight micro channels very well behaved. Actually you just have a slight trend and you're out of transit and then you have your transit and you have your light curve and it's all very nice. And you need maybe a two second order polynomial to, to detrend that. But then, you know, you get to the 3.6 channel. So this is a silicon arsenide detector. Um, so these are more um, stable, um, but this is an MCT uh, detector and this is what, what will fly on James Webb as well. Um, and this is a, quite an interesting um, systematic here. So this is the transit and everything else is, is systematic noisy. So you can see that it's off the order of the transit itself. And what we actually want to measure is the small deviation of a 10 to the minus five deviation on the transit, mean transit depth here. That's our atmospheric signal. So we're looking at 
two orders of magnitude, three orders of magnitude, sometimes higher systematic noise. So you can really see how instrument systematics um, affect our understanding of, of atmospheres in, in these wavelengths. And then here it's eclipse a spectra, so when the planet goes behind the star, and you can barely see the transit. I mean, here, here, and you know, there. So it's, it, these, these are very, very small measurements. Now, in the past, you know, people have, have worked on, on this for quite some time now. In the past, these were all parametric approaches um, where you take an X and Y position of the, of, the, of the point spread function on the detector, and you're trying to correlate this with a parametric, you know, ad hoc, self-prescribed self um, um, uh, function to, to, the, to the flux. And that works quite well to a degree, but it, it, it opens you up to biases in the data analysis quite frequently. Now, there have been, to, to mitigate that, people have been quite clever for, for quite some time now and, and, and try to get away from the human bias and the, you know, just, uh, self-prescribed um, detrending routines um, to more statistical approaches. Um, so we've got Gaussian processes up here and independent component analysis, which is what um, our group um, focused on for, for quite a few years. Um, and the, the idea of that is that you, you take the data itself and rather than prescribing a functional form for this detrending, that you know, the machine will learn what to do with the data itself and, and, and take that decision-making away from you. Um, so this was uh, Ignaz et al. 2016, so this is quite a while ago now, um, was uh, a Spitzer data challenge, it was the last one, where they looked at exoplanets specifically and the individual um, um, algorithms at the time. And um, ours, the independent component analysis, um, won, won hands down in, 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 in terms of reliability and repeatability. Didn't get a price, didn't get anything. We got a, we got a mention in a paper, so that was a bit sad. But um, otherwise, yes, uh, so there are quite a few routines um, out there and, and methodologies. Now, the, the thing is with independent components is that it's, a, it's a, a, basically um, a, sh a shallow um, approach. It's 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 a it's a linear detrending rather than a non-linear detrending, and all, most of these noise sources are have at least some non-linear component to it. So we thought, like, okay, well, neural networks uh, are uh, basically you can you can identify you can define an independent component analysis as a as a first. Uh, one single shallow layer of a neural network. So we thought like, okay, so neural networks would be a natural extension to this and might actually be able to capture the noise a little better. So there are multiple neural networks and I will just give you a very brief, extremely brief overview on uh, what we've done um, here. So uh, this is a simple feed forward network where you have a time series, um, a T minus one. So these are your time indices and uh, with a with a linear feed forward metal, uh, network or convolutional network these are basically taken as, as static inputs so you have a one-dimensional series and then you, you you know you transform it into a a higher hidden layer and then some sort of output now that works quite well and it's been used for um, planet detection in a couple of papers um in the past um, quite quite efficiently, but it doesn't, um, these don't model um, time dependence explicitly. And that can be a problem if you want to start using this trained neural network and predict future time steps. And that's kind of what we want to do. Um, if we want to just have a static series, time series and um, work with that, that sort of approach is fine. But if we want to take a previous time series, um, and then predict into a transiting event what the what the noise would be um, at that point. These sometimes quite often break down. Oh, sorry, wrong way. Um, so what we've looked at then is what's called the long short-term memory network. Um, so that's again very oversimplified. Uh, so apologies for that. Um, but the difference between um, the the previous one. And the, uh, and the long short term memory is that um, information is propagated throughout the network 
on um, on each layer. So the previous one in a sort of um, restricted Boltzmann machine, there are no interlinks between these hidden neural network layers, um, but it's just being fed upwards. In this case, there is this time dependence being propagated forward. So what that what that means is that it um, it, it can learn the auto regressive component of a time series. So these LSTMs are um, very specifically built for modeling um, time series um, very well. So they can be stacked as well. So you quite often only have one layer and that's your, your standard um, setup that you have your input and then you have one layer of these time correlated um, um, network cells and then they give you an output, whatever that might be. That might be a detrended neural net, a detrended time series or something like that. Um, what we've done is that um, we've we've increased this to several different layers, so you get another layer which learns from from this layer. So so it starts building up um, a much more deep, uh, much deeper understanding of, of 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 the time component. So it can model short variations as well as long variations um, quite nicely. Now, um, you know, this is this is a bit detailed, but have a look at the reason why I put this in is because have a look at the link down here, because this is an, I thought, an excellent description of LSTMs if you want to go into it. So they really go into um, a, a high level overview of how it works conceptually and why it works conceptually really well. But what you have to look at in an in a individual LSTM cell is that it has these multiple gates. And these are these are quite important to how the neural network um, manages its data. So you have your input here, which is your time step. So this is your photometry point at at, at time t, and then that is 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 fed into an individual cell, and it has a previous state. So it has it has the previous state from the previous time step, but it also has an internal state, and the internal state basically tells you. Um, how important the previous information is. And it will do, uh, it has different gates here. So it has a forget gate where um, the neural net will first of all identify whether the um, previous information that it holds um, is relevant to the current um, input data. If it's not, very, it's, if it's not relevant um, or if it's very different, it will forget the previous information because it's, it doesn't add anything. If it's if it's similar, it will it will retain that previous information and combine it with the current information here, um, and that way it 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 allows it to have a auto regressive component. So it has a it has a time memory, but it can I, it can decide that if if previous time steps and this previous memory is not useful anymore to drop that information. So it's uh, it's self regulating in that respect. Then it has an input gate here where. Where it decides how important is it, and it should be defined, it should be um, combined with previous information, and then it has an output gate where it combines the previous information with the current information, and then feeds it to the next time step. So it's this um, time forward moving system, and then we can, you know, add add them in in you know recurrent layers. So what we've done is, so that's a normal LSTM. So what we've done, normal LSTMs like shallow LSTMs are not good enough to, to really model the, the time series that we have. So, so we had a look around and then found um, uh, some amazing research by Amazon because they have very similar issues to us. So it, when they um, predict a price point for a product in a country, um, or set a price point for a product in a country. They do this by looking at all time series of all price points in all countries and then all other things, um, including weather, including stock uh, exchange trends, um, including currency fluctuations, so on and so forth. And, and, and so, so the model has millions of input time series. These are not similar to each other they're, they can be very different in terms of um you know magnitude and in terms of you know sampling and so on and so forth so that's always been an issue with um neural nets that they all have to be the inputs have to be you know aligned with each other um at least on a magnitude scale 
Otherwise, there's the, the training issues. But Amazon came up with this deep autoregressive model, which is basically this very deep neural network, um, LSTM, to, to solve this. Um, yeah, so we thought like, okay, if Amazon uses that, um, it's probably powerful enough um, for our needs. Um, so um, we had a look at it, um, and it, it is. So what the the advantage of this of this network architecture as well is that it's probabilistic. So we have a we have a we have a likelihood, um, which um, in our case is Gaussian, but it doesn't need to be Gaussian. Um, so the um, the representation uh, internal representation here is a probabilistic one. So you're sampling from a Gaussian distribution. So you're representing a, a mean and a, and a variance. And that means you can sample from that distribution and use that to predict the next step um, with a probability function, rather than a deterministic um, output, like with normal LSTMs where you just get a number, but you don't know what the uncertainty on that number is. Here we actually get, a, a, get an error bar. So that's... Um, exactly what we wanted and that's exactly what we tried so here this is uh, from mario's paper where we basically show that this is the time series you know the, the wibbly wobbly uh detrended no not well raw time series um that's the transit and then we have covariate time series as well so for example x and y position of the light on the detector or um temperature of the detector um jitter noise so on and so forth so you can feed all of these in simultaneously into this deep stacked um, autoregressive network. And, and, it, and then you add this um, likelihood function up here, which then outputs the um, a probability distribution rather than individual deterministic points. And the idea then is that you train on all the data that you have that isn't your science data. So you're, you're cutting out your, um, your actual transit events, but you're doing pre or post transit. And then you're trying to predict what would happen during that period. Idea of that is obviously that if you if you cut out your science, you're you're not going to train on it. So you're not overtraining. Um, yeah, so just to give you an example of the of the sort of data, I mean you've seen it before. This is sort of input data on the left. Um, you know, you, you can see the variability here, and this is due to the instrument. No, sorry, the, the telescope jitter. Um, so these are the basically the reaction wheels jittering around. Um, um, so, but you know, you can see clearly the autoregressive nature of that, and that's also reflected in you know the auxiliary information here, the covariates, um, the x and y position on the detector. So, if you, oops, sorry. If you start learning it here, um, so we, we tried learning on, on different um, regions, so from 60 time steps to like 120 time steps, and that gives you, uh, and that determines how um, low frequency the noise can be, right? So if you if you have a if you have a smaller learning range here, you, you can't really pick up on, on large scale trends um, because the neural network won't just won't see what's happening um, long enough. But um, yeah, so we, 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 we tend to train on a, on a larger time, time window. And then, and then we, we, we um, let it predict um, ahead of time for a few sort of 10 to 20 time points. And when we start moving this entire block forward um, and then keep training on this and keep training on that forth and back. So it goes both in forward and backwards in time. Um, yeah, and then we hope to predict the what happens in the transit so that's a that's the example of the of the training set so we've trained on the green regions here and we wanted to predict on the red region and it looks like so the gray um yeah so the gray points here the gray scatter i hope you can see that that's the real data and then the uh the the yellow is the is the final model um and yeah, you can see that it actually works quite well. So we were quite um, pleased by that and then taken it a bit further and, and actually done um, a previous data set, which is you know quite quite a standard data set when it gets to Spitzer photometry uh, from um, Eric Eagle um, on HD 209458B, which is a hot Jupiter. 
So you have these um, six time series this year. They all have very different noise properties. So this one basically just got an exponential function here. Um, whilst others have a mix of exponential and you know jitter noise. And uh, we've basically managed to get a very good prediction out just from you know training on all of them uh, simultaneously and training on individual ones as well. So um, so what we would do is we would train on all of them, sort of have a pre-trained network so they'd seen this type of noise before, and then we would start training on on the individual light curve as well. And it's it's really really picking up the the exact trends, which is quite um, quite good. Um, yeah, and these are the corrected time series. So um, that's we thought was pretty pretty nice. Um, you can you can actually run this iteratively. You don't have to tell the code where the time where the where the transit is, um, but it can work it out itself by you know just the the deviation so you can basically take every every time you predict the time series here the red one you can add a transit um model in there or, you know just a you know normal transit model here and 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 fit um the the raw data and then see whether you know what the chi squared is of that and and you can then do that iteratively and then you, you can move the the transit model forth and back in time until you know you get a best fit um, noise model and transit model, so it, it can it can basically identify exactly where where the sign signal is by itself. So this is actually quite useful. So the reason, kind of, why we've done this is Spitzer is an easy easy test case, and if you look at you know the comparison of our data uh, output and transit depths to Eric Eagles, for example, we are we you know mostly within range, but we have much less um variability than than a parametric approach so that suggests that previous you know analyses would that suggest that you know these um transit depth variations are due to the planet um might not be due to the planet at all but might be due to the um the trending of the data now the the the, the good thing about this system is that it can be scaled infinitely so you, we we've only taken six light curves now but it can be a hundred thousand light curves and that's what we're currently working on is to run this on for example the kepler data set but instead of what people have been doing now to detrend individual stars um individual time series of stars do the whole thing in one go and learn the covariance between every single um, star and the idea here is that obviously stellar noise will be very different from star to star but the instrument noise should be very similar right so there should be an underlying component vector that could be derived um, by analyzing um, the whole thing as a big data approach right so if we go then um, to the atmospheric modeling um, so we, we we're doing a lot of modeling of exoplanet uh, spectra at UCL. So we've got the TAVRX code, which is um, being used quite a lot and it's open source to do transmission emission and sort of phase curve modeling as well. But, you know, what, what does that actually mean? Um, so back in the day, say 10, 15 years or so now, um, uh, modeling of, of light curve, of, of, of spectra was basically, you had a, a radiative transfer forward model you had your param parameters, you know, abundance of water and so on and so forth, and then you, you ran your forward model and then you compared it manually to the data. Um, that's obviously statistically not that robust. So, well, you know, the field has very quickly moved towards to, is, you know, do the backwards, so to do the inverse, which is, you know, work out from the data what the parameter distribution is of your model. Um, so that's called retrieval, but in a sense, it's retrieval is just a fancy word for fitting your data. Um, yeah, so retrievals are, you know, can, are getting more and more complex, and they have to get more and more complex because we have, at the moment, we have Hubble, um, and we've got fifteen data points with Hubble, and all we can see is a water band and a little bit of cloud, and it's all not that over a tiny, tiny pressure range, and it's relatively easy to model because the data is just so um, restrictive. Um, but with James Webb coming up and with Ariel coming up, we will have a huge issue because we will actually see the whole chemistry 
um, thermal processes and so on and so forth. So, you know, I mean, you, you all know this and, and members of your group um, do some excellent work on this. But, you know, this is just a slide to show you that it'll get really complicated and we need to be able to model this a from a physics side, but be also from a statistics side. So if the physical model becomes too complex, there's no way we can fit the data anymore because we can't, you can't do a Bayesian sampling anymore where we require a hundred thousand or a million iterations of our model. If the, if the model itself takes several hours, for example, if we have, you know, this equilibrium chemistry in there, for example. So we need to really somehow figure out how to speed up our, our retrievals. Um, yeah, this is just a summary of um, some of the retrieval codes uh, that are currently in circulation. Uh, if I've missed one of them, please let me know. Um, I, I try to you know, be relatively comprehensive. But the, the idea here is that on the left, that this is an output of your uh, parameter space. So it's just typical retrieval output where you have um, CO, CH4, temperature, pressure of the clouds here, um, radius. And you can already see that there's a lot of covariance happening and it's a very complex um, probability distribution uh, that you get out of your Bayesian retrieval. So it's a very ill-constrained um, process. Um, and it's, uh, yeah, that's why it takes a long time to, to, to sample this. Now we need to speed this up. Um, quite significantly, because at the moment, current retrievals take many, many hundreds of CPU hours for a complex model, sometimes days, and the input, given that the line lists, um, spectroscopic line lists can be several gigabytes to terabytes if we go really high resolution, um, it just becomes infeasible at some stage. Um, yeah, so a while ago, so this is back in 2016, so this is the dark ages of um, neural nets really, um, that was, that was pre-TensorFlow even. Um, I had, we had the idea of um, just, you know, can we at least use a neural network, a simple one to tell us roughly what molecules are in, in the spectrum to then be able to just put them in a retrieval. So, so have a sort of pre-select as a qualitative approach. And, and actually that worked really well. So we, we, we put a spectrum in, so we trained this neural net as a simple deep belief network and and it, it predicted the probability of for example water existing or so on and so forth so yeah that was the you know sort of the first um dab at, at trying to do this um with deep learning and you know hope fortunately the field has moved on um quite significantly but back in the day it was a big thing and the daily mail which is you know one of these newspapers that, um, since it's being recorded here, I'm, I'm not going to say what I um, <laughs> what I think. It's a fantastic newspaper. Um, I read it daily, um, and the Daily Mail basically made out of our paper, we, which we call the neural net Robert, um, um, that you know AI hunting for aliens. So it was, it was, it's, um, it's quite funny to see um, how, how, how things then transpire. And I loved the, um, this is what they put in as, you know, the artist impression of what's actually happening, which I thought, thought was great. You have, you have this sentient AI robot that, you know, still looks at manual folders. So, well, no, yeah, I mean, there, there you go. So yes, do read the Daily Mail. Um, it's a great newspaper. Uh, can't recommend it strongly enough. So, yes, um, people have moved on since, fortunately. And um, this is a, just a, to give you a quick update on, on, on some recent papers. Um, people have tried to go about this in different ways. And it's actually quite creative because um, they're quite different and they all have their merits and, you know, also cons sometimes. Um, Hims et al. Um, in the US has uh, just published a paper where they've basically decided like, okay, we don't want to do the full inverse process because that's very ill constrained. What we really want is we want a faster radiative transfer model. So can we just learn radiative transfer uh, with a neural net and then use the neural net as a surrogate model to our 
usual physics model. So this is what they've done. And, and then they put that neural network surrogate into a standard Bayesian sampler, like in a Markov chain Monte Carlo, and, and just let it go wild. Um, and actually that works really well. Um, and it's quite an impressive, nice paper. Um, where here on the on the right hand side, they've they've shown the, the predicted, which is the blue, against the true um, forward model. And this is just one of many plots in their paper. I just chose this one, but you can see that it's it's doing very well actually. Um, so so that's very very promising that you know neural networks can actually learn astrophysics by example because what these and you have they have a training data of um you know um forward models of spectra and then they learn how to reproduce these spectra and in that process they have to learn the underlying physics to be able to do that um so that's that's very promising so in their other approaches so in 2018 we published a paper on trying to do the full inverse process so not having a Bayesian sampler anymore, but just, you know, a network that just gives us the solution as soon as it sees um, um, a spectrum. So we used uh, generative adversarial networks, and I'm not going to go into, into how they work, but basically um, they're likelihood free. So these networks are very well um, adapted to very complex likelihood functions, which we have in our, in our retrieval as well. So that works quite well. So here we have our generated data, which is from the network, which is red, and our real spectrum, um, which is black. So again, it's very good um, fit. And then probability, in quotation mark, probability distributions at the bottom of um, um, what, what the abundance of these individual atmospheric parameters is. The, that works. It's a little unstable. Sometimes GANs are a bit temperamental, so um, be be aware if you ever use one. Um, th the issue with these um, approaches is that they're not uh, formally Bayesian. So the, the probabilities that you get out are not formal Bayesian probabilities, and they're sometimes hence quite hard to interpret because there's the error of the data convolved with the unknown error of the neural network. Um, and you have relatively little understanding of the bias. Uh, Cobb et al is, a, is an interesting paper as well, 2019, uh, where they used ensemble um, neural networks to, to do the same thing. Then others are, um, other approaches that use random forests. So random forests uh, are not neural networks, um, but also machine learning. And they are useful because they're, they're easier to interpret and easier to train. Um, the issue is, so this is a, this was in Nature Astronomy, this paper by Marques uh, Naylor. Um, and Nixon and Madhu Sudan is basically an update of, of, of that technique um, later on. And they are quite good. Um, so they, they capture the, the retrieval process very well and they can actually, um, you know, reproduce the, the, the real or real looking posterior distributions quite well. Uh, <laughs> Again, they're not formally Bayesian, which is a problem, and they don't um, they generalize very well. So you, you, you have to almost retrain them for every single planet, um, which is good if you, if you have multiple retrievals for one individual planet, then that's great, and you can just speed that up. But if you, if you want a more generic tool, um, ra um, random forests are a bit more difficult to generalize. Yeah, so I mean, there's there's obviously there's not only one big elephant in the room with with all this current work. Um, there are there are multiple. There's a there's a there's a there's a, there's a herd of elephants, um, and we don't really understand um, what these networks learn. We 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 understand what we put in, and we understand what, and it gives out something. It gives out a distribution of a parameter, for example, or, but we don't understand what it actually does in between. Um, we don't really know how they learn. So because we are just using gradient descent methods, um, you know, how, how does it represent the physics in, in a neural network exactly? Um, uh, we don't really know most of the times whether they're biased. Um, so what happens if you, uh, if, you, if, you, if you have a real data set that hasn't been you know, defined in the training data, it precisely, 
um, will it come up with a biased um, result or not? I mean, we, we just don't know, really. And we don't understand what the uncertainty of the network itself is quite often. So, so yes, um, that's obviously an issue. And I think that's one of the main problems with you know, broader adoption in the field. And, and you know, this is applicable to many other fields as well. So this isn't, this isn't only an exoplanet problem. So there's um, this you know, growing field. I mean, it's, it's, it's the latest trend basically in, in machine learning and it's, it's explainable AI, um, which tries to um, you know, um, work out how, how these black box models actually behave and, and whether we can infer um, human understandable behavior from these black box models. And how how can we do that? So there, there are multiple um, ways of doing that. So I'm, I'm not going to really give an overview of explainable AI because that is worth twenty lectures. Um, it's it's a huge field, and there's so much amazing work being done. But if if you want, have a look at this paper down here, the Barredo uh, Arieta et al. 2020, which is um, a, a long but extremely thorough and very, very good overview of, of the current state of the art in that field. Uh, so I would really suggest that paper. So there are multiple ways of you know, uh, tackling to find out what, what happens in your black box. Um, what we are looking into um, here with our, our current research is, um, is something called local explanations, which is what happens if you vary your inputs um, you know, and then infer by the variability of your output what that actually means in terms of what's going on inside. So, you know, trying just doing a Monte Carlo, really, a sort of jack jackknife Monte Carlo. Um, feature relevance, um, you know, how relevant is an individual feature in your sort of spectrum or time series to the overall classification of the neural network? So, this is again quite similar. And visualization is can you actually? start seeing you know um, for an autoencoder for example you can you can look into the inner um, representations of, of the network and see whether there are clusters uh, that have been um, formed by the network and then you can interrogate those clusters and then let it um, um, visualize what that means so so these three um, approaches that we're taking at the moment um, you can simplify your model of course as well you can add text explanation so this is quite advanced um, here down here and not necessarily useful for us, but um, the, the neural network should be able to describe in words what it's done and why it's done that, um, or give us an example of why it's done that. So these are quite, 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 quite impressive papers down there. Yeah, so we've um, published a paper recently. So it's uh, just in the, should just on, well, we got the referee report back. It was good. Um, so hopefully it'll be finally accepted in the next few weeks. And we, 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 we did a few things in that paper. And the first thing is there's quite, quite a bit of controversy coming up now on what neural network architecture is actually best to represent um, um, radiative transfer. So is it a, a, a feed forward, a multi-layer perceptron, is it a convolutional net, or is it an LSTM, which you know, where you model time behavior. Um, turns out so we've we've added all these in and then it turns out that all networks are basically fine it's it's architecture independent um radiative transfer can actually be learned quite well by any of them so so that's pretty good and then we you know we focused on the aerial mission because we've got the aerial simulator in-house but it also applies to james webb basically and we'll have a james webb follow-up paper and um, the idea is you, you get you get these um, plots quite often in your network papers now where you have the predicted H2O output and the true H2O output, for example, or parameter output. And you know, it should be on this diagonal line. If it's not, it means there are issues. Um, and these, these plots are quite useful. Um, they show you deviations quite immediately, like with CO, carbon monoxide, and aerial, they don't go well together. Um, just because of the you know the sampling of of the, of the of the spectrum, so you can see that you know immediate issues or that it veers off at low um, 
abundances for water, for example. But the, the problem with these plots is they're not as informative as, 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 they, as they appear to be because the, the sampling isn't uniform. So, you know, you get clusters here and it doesn't tell you much about the overall bias or the, the, the variance of, of the neural network. So we've investigated this a bit further and then come up with these sort of average deviation plots. So this is for our best fitting neural network architecture, which is just a simple feed forward network. It's the most simple of them all actually works the best. Um, and you can see that <clears throat> this, um, the higher the curve here, the more biased the network is, the less likely it will find a true value um, for a given abundance. And the, the error bars mean um, show the variance of the prediction. So, uh, you know, you have to look at both bias and, and variance um, equally. And it's interesting that behavior quite often is, we, we didn't really know what to make of it, but it actually makes sense that for, for high abundances of a, of a molecule, it does well, it does okay. It has, it's a bit biased, but it's quite close to the truth. And then as you drop the abundance, you know, the spectral feature becomes fainter and smaller, and it's, it's starting to over, um, overestimate um, water quite, uh, but also the variance, it, it becomes less certain until it basically disappears entirely. Um, and then it's like, yes, it knows that there's no water left anymore. Um, so the bias actually drops by just the neural network dropping, dropping that as well. And then interestingly enough, it goes, it goes back up again because it, it will then just try to interpret noise at some stage. So there's this, you, you, would, you would expect a, a linear decrease ideally of, well, no, actually linear increase. So the bias would go up and the uncertainty would go up in a, in an, in a traditional way. But what you actually get is that you, you have a sort of linear regime here and then it's like, oh no, actually there's nothing. And then it goes back to a sort of linear regime up here. So it's the it's the it's that nonlinear nature of the neural network that we believe is 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 where, where it manages to classify obvious cases um, of of stuff not being there and stuff being there. In between cases are are harder. Then you know we also looked at what what happens if 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 you change the abundance of your um, dominant um, feature, um, for example or one of the dominant features in the, in the, in the spectrum. So we had here um, the, a spectrum that had water, CH4CO, but also um, NH3 in here. Um, and for a high NH3 um, spectrum, so with loads, uh, loads of um, N, um, ammonia features um, or a lower NH3 spectrum, the actual deviation and predictions change. So it's, it, 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 it hints at, you know, the, the, the spectral features being a bit correlated and the neural network being being put off by by a third um, feature. So sorry, sorry, I should I should explain here that NH3 wasn't um, in, in, the t in the training data. So it doesn't know what NH3 is, but it, it knows what water CH4 and CO is. So this is for unseen or unknown spectral features that we haven't included in our models. So this could be in real life, this could be systematic noise, but for James Webb, it's probably a, a spectral feature on absorber that we just don't know what it is now. Um, for now, and if if there's if there's a lot of this unseen feature, you know, it, it, as you almost expect, is you 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 get you get a decrease in performance. But what it does, instead of you know just increasing its error bar, it actually starts biasing the result um, quite strongly. So. It tries to fill in the unseen feature with um, features that it knows. So it tries to fill in NH3 with water, for example. So this isn't actually that bad. It, 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 it sounds horrible, but what actually happens in a normal retrieval is exactly the same thing. That because it's just, you're just fitting shapes to a, a spectrum uh, that it's just trying to um, compensate um, as much as it can with what it has to get a low enough chi-squared. So that's that's normal behavior, but it's you know it's interesting to see that this happens as well for um, neural networks. Yeah, so then we basically decided it's like, okay, well, knowing all that, um, how, when 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 can we actually ever trust a neural network at all? 
Um, I mean, at what point, at what abundance, for example, of water or methane or CO or CO2, does the prediction become unreliable? Um, and so we, 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 we came up with a metric um, uh, which, which measures the probability of the feature being correct um, in the neural network. And we, we, we set a threshold, a random threshold here, 70%, but that could be you know, anything. Um, and we can see that um, you know, if you trust this, this threshold here, that strong features are you know, very well characterized or well enough characterized um, because they are visible in the spectrum, the clear features that are visible. And as the spectral features become smaller, they disappear behind other spectral features or, um, or, 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 or the noise of the spectrum, the error bar, and then basically it, it starts dropping down. So it's, it's behaving as you'd expect it to. Uh, it's behaving very similar to a normal fitting routine, to a normal MCMC -MC sampler, where you know, if, you, if your feature becomes too small, you just become very uncertain. But it basically gives you this um, now metric where you can, you know, when you build a neural network, you can you can test is this one better than the other. It gives you, it, it allows you to compare um, what you've done to previous work now, which is hasn't been the case in previous studies, and it's it's a little annoying. And we've done it as well in our papers that every time you read a neural network paper, it's like, oh, this is the best. Ignore everyone else. We're you know. We are, we are the architecture to use in the future and we'll revolutionize the field. I mean, we've said this ourselves in papers many times, and, but it's, it's, it's just not founded in science and because there is no metric to actually um, um, you know, compare like with like. And so we've, we've started building um, this sort of metric. On the left-hand side, we are gonna have the bias of our a, of a entire training set. And, and you can see how as, as the, as the abundance of the uh, molecules drops, the bias in the network increases, which makes sense. Um, right, then we looked at what, what else can we do? So I'm, I'm nearly finished, by the way. Yeah, so what else can we do with that? And does it actually make sense? So there are different architectures in the fields that are, some are very simple um, and some are very complex and probably too complex. I mean, our, GAN paper is definitely too complex, I say now with hindsight. And what happens if we if we actually take a simple model and then a complex model, right? A much deeper architecture. Does the deep architecture actually allow you to model the data better? And the answer is not really. It it reduces the bias, which is the the the, the bar here, but the error bar on the prediction here increases. So the bias decreases, but the variance increases, and you're actually not doing that much better. What happens if you add more training data? So this is a small training data set up here and then a larger one down here. It helps It helps the deeper network, the more complex network more than it helps the, the simple network. So the simple network doesn't gain much, but um, it doesn't help significantly and it doesn't help enough. Um, so for a, for a small data set, always go for simple model basically because there's no point and for, for a bigger data set, you can go from a complex model, but it's, it, the differences are not massive. So what, what you gain in, in, in bias uh, reduction, you lose in variance because you have so many more neurons and they induce noise. So that was an interesting, slightly sobering and, um, conclusion as well. So, you know, then we, then we went on, um, how can we actually, trust this at all um, or what what features in the spectrum actually make it decide that this the the molecule is there um, you know so feature importance is basically um, the, the the step here um, and does it actually make sense from a physical perspective or can we actually learn something new uh, in interpreting um, data because this this neural network learns by example only it doesn't have physical laws in it so it has to build its own physical laws. Are they similar to what we expect from our own intuitive understanding of a spectrum or not? And it's quite interesting. So if you zoom into this, um, it's, it's what you expect um, 
you know, if you're if you're a seasoned um, spectroscopist, what you would do yourself is what the neural network does. So, starting with a simple example of carbon monoxide, um, it basically you know focuses. So the lighter colors here mean that um, these points are more important um, for uh, for its prediction um, of carbon monoxide of a of the feature. So um, for carbon monoxide, it's you know very simple. It basically feature it, it, it looks at uh, the main bands for CO um, and that's it. It doesn't need any other information at all. And you know that's what we would do. We would look for the CO bands um, if we look at it by eye. It becomes more interesting if you have uh, broadband absorbers like methane or water that basically have bands everywhere um, and have this continuum um, absorption. And here it's interesting because it doesn't you, you know these are all methane features but it doesn't it doesn't really look at any of these methane features at all but it only looks at the new free band at 3.1 micron um and that is that makes sense in a sense that it is the strongest feature in the spectral range so it is the one that is least affected by low signal to noise so by spectral error bars but it's also the feature that least overlaps with other spectral features in the band it doesn't overlap with water for example you can see it down here it's just offset while other features here are small overlapping with water or co2 for example so it basically chose the it chose the easy one um, and decided to like okay well if i can measure that because that's a clean signal i can measure ch4 um, so that's pretty cool. But then it becomes more complex if you go for um, features that don't necessarily have spectral features. So here we added clouds, but only like um, um, an opaque cloud layer. So that's basically just a, a flat line cutting off your spectrum on the bottom. Um, so we didn't add any me scattering. We added some Rayleigh scattering as well. But how does it you know, come up with clouds, for example? And clouds is an interesting one because it, it measures the the Rayleigh point down here. So this 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 one is just about on the Rayleigh curve, coming down here, and it measures the lowest point of the spectrum, and then it measures the highest point of the spectrum. So what it does, what it basically figures out, it's trying to figure out the scale height um, of the um, of the atmosphere, and whether this is flat um, by flattened by the cloud, or whether it is a, is is a stronger curve. In a clear atmosphere, you'd have the Rayleigh coming down and and the spectrum, you know, dipping dipping down first before coming up again. So it measures this angle and it measures the height of the entire spectral feature. Um, and it does it does so by you know using the methane point here because it's the highest point, but it also you know is influenced by by water and so on and so forth further down. So that that was quite interesting. It. It makes sense intuitively, so so we were quite pleased by that. Um, um, yeah, but you know, it was it was surprising that it basically understands um, spectra from a from a physical point of view. So it understands what it needs to look at to actually derive individual parameters. Um, same with temperature. Temperature is even harder because temperature is mainly driven by the scale height of the atmosphere, like how puffed up is the atmosphere rather than anything else. All the other effects temperature has, for example, on um, the um, absorption lines in, in this case are secondary. So it's basically just how fluffy is the atmosphere. And here again, it does, it, it, it does, it does a combination of points in you know, high up, but also lower down to figure out how big the, how big the spread of the individual spectral features are from you know, the baseline. It's trying to find a baseline here and it's trying to find the highest point of the absorber to figure out, and and also the you know a, a Rayleigh point down here as a um, we think as a you know reference point. So it's trying to figure out the scale height. Yeah. So so that's pretty cool. Uh, we thought and 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 it, it bodes well. It it means that it understands physics and the prediction it makes are, are, are driven by physics. Uh, and driven by the data in a correct and meaningful way, rather than just it learning a solution and just regurgitating that solution um, because it's seen a simple, similar example before. So, you know, I mean, so that's good. They do work. 
they are a bit biased. They are a bit yeah, uncertain sometimes, but you know, we, we can get there. Um, but you know, there's there's a way forward. Right. Just to to finish off um, very quickly, something completely different. Um, we have uh, aerial meets you, aerial mission. Um, we have a data challenge coming up again. So we had one in 2019, which was very successful on looking at stellar spots, um, spot crossings um, in transits. And can we detrend that with machine learning? And that was part of the European Conference for Machine Learning. Uh, attracted a hundred and. 20 people, um, different teams across the world, and the top two uh, winners got a free registration for ECML, uh, the conference, or uh, the money equivalent. And that was also featured. We also had a session at EPSC uh, in Geneva and at the aerial conference. So it's a lot of a lot of exposure. It was very successful, and we just published a paper, um, which I should have linked here, Nicolau, uh, 2020. Um, where we, we, we showed the top five solutions to this problem. Now, the problem was a bit oversimplified because we didn't include any detector systematics, just stellar noise. Um, this year, we will do the whole shebang and, and, and add all these um, distortions I showed you in the first few slides um, to the data and then give it to whoever wants to model it. Um, you know, this, these are just you know, the examples from previously on how awful this H is the Hubble example and raw data and then sort of detrended and Spitzer as you've seen. So, so we'll, we'll build an aerial simulation for that. So we'll do this as well um, with um, Le, um, Lesia um, in, in Paris and, and then give it to the machine learning community and the planetary science community to, to work on that. So, you know, competition starting 1st of April. So, you know, stay tuned. Um, uh, runs until July, and then you know if you win, you get um, a, a bunch of money, some like six hundred euros or something, or a free ticket to ECML or EPSC, whichever you want. Um, yeah, so that would be that will be good. Hopefully, um, we'll have a website coming up soon. Um, so so stay tuned. Unfortunately, I don't have a link yet. That would have been better, but um, I haven't written the website yet, so. So it's still still in progress, but it'll come up. Yeah, so thanks very much. And I'll just leave you with the conclusions that, you know, we are still very much at the beginning of uh, using machine learning and AI in exoplanets. But, you know, initial papers suggest that it is a feasible way forward, at least we're not fully there yet. Um, but given that, you know, we can actually build explainable networks now, we can actually understand that what these networks are doing actually makes sense. So it's it's a it, it at least shows a path forwards that is meaningful and that it can be used in the future. Yeah, and then please please sign up to the data challenge. It'll be fun. So thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I think there's uh, already questions in the chat. Uh, so I think I'll probably start with those because those were the, the first ones and then we'll see whether there are other questions uh, from, the, from, from the audience. Uh, so from Jorge Lillo, uh, he says, great talk, Ingo. Uh, very interesting approach and application to the exoplanet field. Uh, uh, he, he actually had to leave, but it's good that we are recording so that he can, he can watch the answer. So he says, uh, I would like to ask a question. Are the neural networks you are developing open access? And how can we use them for our own data set, particular, in particular for uh, Kepler light curves? Well, thanks very much. Um, yes, they are open. Um, the ERC requires to have everything open access, which I think is a great thing to do. Um, so we publish everything on our GitHub. Um, we and we publish the training sets as well. Um, mm -hmm. So that everything um, it should be the links should be in the paper, but um, I can also send you um, a link. Um, applying it to your own data sets and Kepler like us to two methods really um, either get in touch with us and we can, we're very happy to collaborate. Um, absolutely. Or, you know, take the take the code it's there um 
and and fiddle around with it. It's it's written in Keras, and we're now moving to PyTorch, so it's uh, they're relatively you know they're quite easy to to um, to adapt. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Ah, um. <laughs> okay, here from uh, apparently Fernando Navarga Avalo says, uh, "Thank you for this great talk and this very nice GitHub page." <laughs> GitHub page, yeah, I think I should have I should have put a link to the GitHub page and yeah. stuff. Um, so sorry about that. Um, but just email me if you have any questions, um, and when we'll right. again, very happy to share. Let's see, are there any other questions? Uh, I think I have a couple, if I may. Uh, so I've seen that basically in your uh, in your now it's uh, simulations, no DOM for Arial. So mm -hmm. I see that you're basically targeting um, the most abundant molecules that you expect in exoplanet atmospheres, no like water, uh, CO, CO two, ammonia, uh, methane. But do you expect to find any other uh, molecule? Like oh, yes. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, this is just a proof of concept, right? Um, this, this work was mainly focused on neural network development rather than um, find the issue is, but you're absolutely right. The issue is we will expect a lot more, especially with James Webb coming up. And, and we won't have the line lists for all of them. And it will be, you know, there will be known unknowns and there will be unknown unknowns. Um, so one, and that's that's a really tricky problem to to do with, with retrieval models is we, we need to build a code that actually tells us um, that something's missing, but we don't know what's missing, um, but that the model itself is incomplete. We, we need to have a probability measure of completeness. Um, you know, I mean, there, there, there are multiple ways of going about it. It's like, you know, adding more physics and physics and then, and then reducting it back to something that makes sense or, or have a, a, a causal neural net, maybe something like that. It, yeah, it's a bit outstanding, but yes, I mean, it's, it's not only the molecules, but it's the, uh, the temperature pressure profiles, I mean, the 3D nature of it will be really apparent. And there are quite a few papers now um, showing and that. Even uh, if there are aerosols, do you call them in, the, in a way? Yeah, 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 yeah. So well, loads of aerosols, they they will emit it. Oh, you know, I mean, you get, you get, you get the me scattering on one side, which is fine. But then, you know, we, we've got instatite clouds on these hot Jupiters. They will emit in the, in the mid infrared. Um, so James Webb will be able to tell us some of the composition of these aerosols, hopefully. But well, we will have to see. But yes, I mean, then then we have you know disequilibrium chemistry. We have photon chemistry. Um, we we're, we're working on including them now, but it's a uh, it's a race against time, really, until we get the data. But I think you know my my impression is that we will get James Webb data, and it will be of such high quality and resolution. That we initially won't know what to do with it properly. <laughs> I think it'll it'll take us it'll take us quite a long time to really nail it down. It'll be fun. Yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> and then the other question that I had was that you had a, a paper last year. I think it was on using these kind of uh, techniques, but for characterizing uh, planets. Um, in our solar system, Saturn, I think. So do you use the, the same type of techniques or that you have described uh, today or were you using something different? Um, yeah, so or the from the first... It can be extrapolated uh, to uh, science done, uh, but for yeah, solar system. Yeah, definitely can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're, so we're, we have two PhD students now working on Venus and Mars. Mm -hmm. um, because it, you're absolutely right. Um, and the, the amazing thing about solar system science is that the data quality is amazing and there's so yeah. much data. Um, you know, exoplanets, they hide kind of behind the error bars, like, eh, can't possibly tell, but yeah, that, that doesn't work for, for, for Saturn. Um, yeah, so for that paper, we did a, 
hyperspectral image analysis. So it's basically a clustering routine where you know each each pixel in our image has a you know spectral component. So you know it's this mm. spectral cube, and and we found that a neural net can cluster individual abundance features really well in that data. So without without any underlying radiative transfer, you can actually bring out um, uh, ammonia cloud abundance, well, ammonia clouds, mm -hmm. the presence of, not the abundance, but the presence of them and map them across data sets. So, but what we want to really do is we want to get the abundance as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so we're, we're working on that. We're working on that in a slightly different context. We're, we're doing um, um, chrism spectra of Mars at the moment. So we just submitted a paper where we do um, again hyperspectral image analysis with neural nets on um, uh, yeah a water tributary feature on Mars. So you know, um, uh, but it's the same technique really. Uh, yeah, but but you're right. It's it's the solar system is the yeah yeah frontier, and there are a couple of groups now in in Europe and in the US starting on this in all seriousness. So it's 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 very very much at the beginning but yeah that is a powerful yeah. technique no? yeah 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 and people are really waking up to it and and a couple of groups are really you know investing heavily on these techniques now um so let's see i think <laughs> that'll be quite great we will be looking forward to that paper <laughs> <laughs> okay are there any other questions no, there are no other questions. Well, ah, uh, yes. Uh, is there? Planet Spectrum Generator. Uh, Thank sorry. you. That is a very good point. Sorry for not including that. Um, we'll definitely do that, um, uh -huh. especially also since the PSG can also retrieve. Yeah. Ah, yeah. Uh, Fernando Navarga Avalos. So he has a question. No, in line with the last comment, did you explore the helium abundance in HD twenty ninety four? No, 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 we didn't. Um, that's something to do. I mean, we've really only focused at like four main molecules now to just understand whether it's possible. Mm -hmm. Now that we know it's possible, you know, we, 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 we will do follow up studies and actually increase the complexity of the chemical model and, and add things like helium and H minus and, and, and all these things. But yeah, that's a very good point. Um, okay, and then the last question. Uh, from Miriam uh, Rangel, depending on the ways to sample, uh, to sample narrows in parameter space, lots of parameters, etc. Advices about when to use multi-nest uh, Monte Carlo, Markov chain, Mark Mark chain multi Monte Carlo, Polycord. Ah, uh, yes. Um, always use multi-nest. Um, I, I, th I, I think it's more robust. Um, because well if, well it has multiple advantages right because you can parallelize it more easily because it's you can you can it's just a monte carlo uh and so you, you have your parameter space and and you you cut it up into individual chunks send them off to individual cpus and then they'll sample individually and then you know come back and then and then it will it'll, it'll identify areas of likelihood more robustly than mcmc i think MCMCs are fine, especially the EMC, so the Foreman Mackey um, uh, paper, I think is, is very good. Um, but I always use multi-nest um, with quite a few um, life points, like a thousand. Polycord, um, if you look at the paper, um, you'll see that it's only really useful if your parameter space is over sort of 80 to 100 parameters. So, you know, when you have the curse of dimensionality really kicking in, you can't use multi-nest or MCMC anymore, um, but you have to do a very sparse sampling technique, which is like polycord. Um, there's been quite a lot of work on, on the cosmology side um, on using um, um, uh, dimensionality compression um, and uh, non-loss non um, techniques using neural nets um, to bring the dimensionality of their models which is huge down to like sort of 10 meaningful principle dimensions and then sample those and then, you know, um, project back out into the original space. 
So if you have huge dimensionality, um, I would suggest going down that route probably because it's just easier to sample. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Um, then if cool. there are no other questions, since there aren't, okay. Well, thank you very much, Ingo, for joining us today. And it was great talking to you. And, Thanks for having uh, me. Yeah, maybe we will have you here when all these uh, madness ends. That would be lovely. Yes.